Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference and will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We continue to expect them to remain at their present levels, at least through the end of 2019, and in any case for as long as necessary to ensure the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. We intend to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the Asset Purchase Program for an extended period of time, past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case, for as long as necessary, to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. The Governing Council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation continues to move towards the Governing Council's inflation aim in a sustained manner. Details on the precise terms of the new series of targeted longer-term refinancing operations will be communicated at one of our forthcoming meetings. In particular, the pricing of the new Teltro 3 operations will take into account a thorough assessment of the bank-based transmission channel of monetary policy, as well as further developments in the economic outlook. In the context of our regular assessment, we will also consider whether the preservation of the favorable implications of negative interest rates for the economy requires the mitigation of their possible side effects, if any, on bank intermediation. The information has become available since our last Governing Council meeting in early March confirms slower growth momentum extending into the current year. While there are signs that some of the idiosyncratic domestic factors dampening growth are fading, global headwinds continue to weigh on area growth developments. The persistence of uncertainties related to geopolitical factors, the threat of protectionism and vulnerabilities in emerging markets are leaving marks on economic sentiment. At the same time, at the same time, further employment gains and rising wages continue to underpin the resilience of the domestic economy and gradually rise in inflation pressures. However, an ample degree of monetary accommodation remains necessary to safeguard favorable financing conditions and support the economic expansion, and thus to ensure that inflation remains on a sustained path towards levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. Significant monetary policy stimulus is being provided by our forward guidance on the key ECB interest rates, reinforced by the reinvestments of the sizable stock of acquired assets and the new series of Teltros. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP rose by 0.2% quarter on quarter in the fourth quarter of 2018, following an increase of 0.1% in the third quarter. Incoming data continue to be weak, especially for the manufacturing sector, mainly on account of the slowdown in external demand which has been compounded by some country and sector specific factors. As the impact of these factors is turning out to be somewhat longer lasting, the slower growth momentum 
is expected to extend into the current year. Looking ahead, the effect of these adverse factors is expected to unwind. The euro area expansion will continue to be supported by favorable financing conditions, further employment gains, and rising wages, and the ongoing, albeit somewhat slower, expansion in global activity. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook remain tilted to the downside on account of the persistence of uncertainties related to geopolitical factors, the threat of protectionism, and vulnerabilities in emerging markets. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, euro area annual HICP inflation was 1.4% in March 2019, after 1.5% in February, reflecting mainly a decline in food, services, and non-energy industrial goods price inflation. On the basis of current futures prices for oil, headline inflation is likely to decline over the coming months. Measures of underlying inflation remain generally muted, but labor cost pressures have strengthened and broadened amid high levels of capacity utilization and tightening labor markets. Looking ahead, underlying inflation is expected to increase over the medium term, supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing economic expansion, and rising wage growth. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money M3 growth increased to 4.3% in February from 3.8% in January. Looking through some volatility monthly flows, M3 growth continues to be backed by bank credit creation, notwithstanding a recent moderation in credit dynamics. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 remained the main contributor to broad money growth. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations rebounded to 3.7% in February from 3.4% in January, reflecting mainly a base effect. Looking through short-term volatility, the annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations has moderated in recent months, reflecting the typical lagged reaction to the slowdown in economic growth. At the same time, the annual growth rate of loans to households remained broadly unchanged at 3.3% in February. The Euro Area Bank Lending Survey for the first quarter 2019 suggests that overall bank lending conditions remained favorable. Our monetary policy measures, including the new series of Teltros that we announced in March, will help to safeguard favorable bank lending conditions and will continue to support access to financing, in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of the economic analysis with signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to rip the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising the longer term growth potential and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural reforms in euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, and boost euro area productivity and growth potential. Regarding fiscal policies, the mildly expansionary euro area fiscal stance and the operation of automatic stabilizers are providing support to economic activity. At the same time, countries where government debt is high 
need to continue rebuilding fiscal buffers. All countries should reinforce their efforts to achieve a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. Likewise, the transparent and consistent implementation of the European Union's fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. Improving the, function, the functioning of the Economic and Monetary Union remains a priority. The Governing Council welcomes the ongoing work and urges further specific and decisive steps to complete the Banking Union and the Capital Markets Union. We are now at your disposal for questions. Mrs. Kolimowski. Piotr Skolimowski, Bloomberg News. Uh, Mr. President, one question. First of all, you mentioned that um, in the context of regular assessment, you will consider whether um, the preservation of favorable implications uh, requires mitigation of possible side effects on uh, bank intermediation from uh, understand from negative rates. You made comments to similar effect at the Watchers Conference recently, and it sparked a lot of speculation that you might be on the cusp of introducing a tiering system. So I would like to, uh, to know from you whether that's something that's on the menu, that's something that you are considering. Uh, that's my first question. And the second is you also mentioned that we'll get the pricing of Teltros in the forthcoming meetings. We've, we saw the bank lending survey yesterday. Um, in, in your assessment, in terms of the loan growth and loan demand, does it give any indication of for the conditions that could underpin the, the, the incentive scheme for, for the next Teltros? Thank you. Well, I would say to the second question, I would answer it's too early just too early so the uh, if you i mean what, if you read the statement i just gave um, there is is it the we it, we in a sense give the the governing council gives the criteria upon which this assessment well, both the teltro 2 teltro 3 and the uh, mitigation of uh, possible side effects would take place, the conditions under which the analysis would be carried out. And it's two conditions. We'll take into account a thorough assessment of the bank-based transmission channel monetary policy, as well as further developments in the economic outlook. So we are looking at that, both things, and uh, right now it's too early to decide about, about both. The, I would say the governing council was pretty I would say, we didn't vote, so it's not unanimous or, or anything, but it was just consensus on the need for further analysis on both issues. And, and that is, in a sense, includes the first question, because this language echoes what I did say in the ECB Watcher speech, and, and that's it. We've got to look at that. Ms. Jones? And, and the way we look is well specified here. We look at the functioning of the financial intermediation channel, as I said, the assessment of the bank-based transmission channel of monetary policy, as well as further developments in the economic outlook. So we have to see how the economic outlook will turn out between now and the next monetary policy meeting. I'm sorry, where, by, by the way, we also will be having the new projections. Thank you. Uh, Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, there seems to be to have been over recent months quite a marked deterioration in the five year on five year inflation swap rate that suggests markets have been becoming more concerned about your ability to hit the inflation target. In the past this the fall in this measure was a trigger for the expansion of QE, the beginning and the expansion of the QE program. So um how concerned are you about this this time around and how would you intend to react if this fall continues and the second topic, we've had some remarks from the US president yesterday saying that he's going to impose tariffs on some European goods. Um, to what extent are you concerned by these remarks and does it re represent a serious risk to the Eurozone economy if this comes about and there's an intensification of the, um, the, the trade relations between Europe and the US? Thank you. Now, the, uh, your first question points out to the uh, continued uh, deterioration 
of uh, inflation expectations over the last uh, several months. And um, we, we, had, we had quite a substantial analysis of uh, why this is so. It's quite clear that the, the uh, sliding of the five-year, five-year inflation expectations corresponds to a deterioration of the economic outlook. Uh, it's also quite clear that uh, as the economic outlook, especially the uh, economic activity, slows down, also the, we, we, we markets expect uh, lesser of a pressure in the labor market. Uh, but we haven't seen that yet. So we have, uh, we have underlying strength in the economy. Uh, and so we analyzed why this is so. The answer is that the expectations have, uh, inflation expectations have deteriorated predominantly because of risk premium or negative risk premium. And which is a big difference with 2016. You may remember that uh, in the early part of 2016, we had a similar deterioration in inflation expectations, but it was different. At that time, uh, it was not because of, not so much because of risk premium, uh, but it was a, a, a real danger of the anchoring. So this is good news in the sense that it says that expectations are responding to the economic outlook but are not the anchoring. However, however, this increase in uh, the negative risk premium might reflect either that market perception that either we don't have instruments, and I think uh, we've shown that we have plenty of instruments, if anything, the market reaction to my ECB watcher speech last time shows that uh, uh, we have plenty of instruments. And, uh, and of course, that, uh, that market reaction demonstrated that markets have fully understood our reaction function. Now, the, 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 second, the second possibility is that uh, we may well, I mean, the markets may think that the governing council would tolerate uh, low inflation, too low inflation, without uh, uh, being the anchor but low. Now let me just dispel any such such impression. We, of course, we remain fully committed to return inflation to two percent without undue delay. But also, let me also point out another aspect of this: our inflation aim doesn't imply a ceiling at two percent. Inflation can deviate from our objective in both directions so long as the path of inflation converges to our medium-term objective. Now, the second question is about this uh, threat of tariffs from President Trump to the Europeans. Um, of course, we listed the threat of protectionism as one of the um, potential um, factors dampening growth in the euro area and elsewhere in the world, as a matter of fact. So this is not, not different from this viewpoint. It would certainly, uh, well, we have to see, first of all, what happens. Because as you've seen in the past, uh, between words and deeds, there is often a big, uh, a big gulf. Uh, but certainly, even, even, uh, even the fact that these threats are being vented with some frequency it certainly undermine undermine uh, general confidence, and uh, and uh, w there is no question about the fact that uh, one of the reasons for the general weakness in the eurozone, but I, I believe also elsewhere in the world, is uh, is due to the confidence uh, weakening that uh, has come from uh, various threats, various vulnerabilities, a combination of effects, but certainly also from these uh, threats of uh, further protectionist measures. Mr. Sims. Hi, Tom Sims from Reuters. Uh, so am I correct to assume that and understand that you did discuss the precise terms of the Teltro at today's meeting? The reason I ask is because um, the June meeting would come just days after you have a new chief economist on board, meaning much of the preparatory work would have to have been done by a predecessor. Um, so do you see the governing council putting off any decision on Teltro until Mr. Lane comes in, that would be in July, at the July meeting, I guess? Um, and a second question on the tiered rate deposit 
issue. Did you discuss the merits of this at today's meeting? And might we see this on the agenda of the Governing Council b during your tenure? Thank you. I mean, we certainly welcome Philip Lane. is a is a is a great addition to our uh, our uh, our team. Uh, but it's not that we're actually uh, sort of um, um, putting our calendar, our decision making, depending on who's going to be on board or not. So let me just separate the two things. Um, we, you asked me whether we discussed the Teltro deal. No, we didn't. And I said this in the in the beginning. We will we will discuss it on uh, on it does say will be details on the precise terms of new series of targeted long term refinancing operations will be communicated at one of our forthcoming meetings. So the pricing of new Teltros will take into account, and I gave the two criteria before, but we haven't discussed that today. On, uh, on the second question, no, either. It's, it's, we haven't discussed uh, uh, the merits or the cons of, uh, of, uh, of mitigating measures. I don't want to identify that with a specific word, and I never did. So it's, um, we, we sort of, we started a process where we will analyze all measures and specifically the two that I mentioned in the introductory statement. This analysis is based on these two criteria uh, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, we need further information. We need further information that will come to us between now and June and in a sense the projections the, that we'll have in June by the staff of the ECB will be, will be an important part of this uh, information set. Mr. Plicat? Having said that, Philip Lane is a fantastic addition to our team. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Draghi, uh, another question for me on, on the issue of, of deposit rates. Um, perhaps you can comment on, on the claims or the, the numbers which have uh, been um, given by the head of the German Banking Association. He, he claimed that the European banks are at a disadvantage of even 50 billion vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the American banks. Uh, it's well known that the European banks, they, they pay around 7.5 billion on the negative deposit rate. And he claimed, and when looking to the US, you see they even get a positive uh, rate for their deposits uh, of about 40 billion, so he's, he calculated like a 50 billion difference, and that's a big disadvantage, and this is a drag on the European banking system. What's your reply on this? Well, I take note of the fact. Uh, it's a fact, and, um, and uh, by the way, so we asked ourselves, how much is prof overall profitability of banks being affected? By the negative, by the negative uh, uh, deposit rate, and um, and we we are actually in the process of carrying out this analysis. But if you compare profitability of our banks, I mean eurozone banks. We, by the way, we're talking about large aggregates uh, to the point of being meaningless, because uh, the way the way this uh, negative deposit rate affects different banking institutions is very different banks are profoundly different between them their business models so but in the aggregate we see that profitability of uh, of eurozone banks is uh, by and uh, by and large uh, uh, like the ones in japan higher than in the uk where there is no negative rate and of course, lower than in the United States. So, and then of course, but I did say in my ECB watch speech that, uh, so we look at this, uh, we'll look as, the, as it says here. We'll also consider whether the preservation of the favorable implications of the negative rates, because we want these implications. The market reaction to that, uh, to that, uh, to my ECB watch speech, uh, basically made clear the markets understood our reaction function. And um, it says, favorable implications of the economy requires the mitigation of their possible side effects, if any, on bank intermediation. So we'll look at that. Uh, Ms. Laird? Laurie Laird, MT Newswires. 
Mr. Joggi, you, um, your forward guidance um, has been very clear, but it hasn't had any conditions. You've never articulated any conditions that would imply a change in that forward guidance. Can you give us any clarification on that, please, uh, particularly on the downside? And also, have there been any discussions, even a in a theoretical sense, about whether if there's a resumption of QE, could equities or would equities have to be part of that program given the limits on bond buying? Well, really, to the second question, we haven't uh, discussed that. Uh, we, uh, what the Governing Council did today was to assess the outlook, which is a weakening uh, picture, picture of weakening growth, to reiterate confidence in the convergence of the inflation path based on a series of factors, and uh, and then reassert, reiterate the readiness to use all the possible and necessary, all the instruments that are necessary to cope with the contingencies that come ahead. And, and this was, uh, I would say, unanimous. And uh, this, 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 this deliberation to use all the instruments it was not the time, I did say something at the beginning, this, this time is not the right time to say, to be sort of, I don't like this instrument or I'd rather prefer another one. We are not yet there. And once we will be approaching that point with the information coming from uh, about the economy and, the, and inflation, we will be better positioned to, to see whether first, whether further action is needed beyond, by the way, let's not forget, that our forward guidance uh, has indeed in the past few months automatically responded to the weakening economic conditions. And, uh, and let's not forget also that it, this forward guidance is, is chained with the horizon over which we'll carry out the repurchases of the bonds. As you see, the, the, it says, uh, we, we intend to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments for maturing securities purchased under the asset purchase program for an extended period of time past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates. So whenever the date when we raise ECB interest rates moves forward, so does the horizon over which we'll actually undertake the purchases, and in any case for as long as necessary to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. So you see that in the existing, uh, in the existing toolbox, in the existing and uh, in acting toolbox, we already have optionality to extend this, uh, the existing instruments. But with the statement today, the Governing Council also said that it's plainly open to use all instruments that would be required by the needed contingency as we gather further and further information. Ms. Weisbach. Annette Weisbach, CNBC. Um, I have a question. Uh, in the minutes, uh, or the minutes actually, are suggesting that some uh, governing council members were not really happy to adjust the forward guidance on rates according to what the market thinks. And some analysts call it backward guidance. You can't be happy with that. Um, so could we get an update on the rates forward guidance as soon as June? And the second question. What is the question? <coughs> the question is that the minutes, the last, the, the minutes. Accounts. The, sorry, the, the accounts. They are suggesting that. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you are forgiven for this. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll learn it. Um, they are suggesting that some members of the governing council are not happy um, to align the forward guidance on rates with what the market expectations are, so to extend it further in the future. My question is, they call it backward guidance, which can't be what you would like them to think. So do you think it's realistic to assume that we get some more of an alignment in the forward guidance on rates as soon as June or perhaps in the forthcoming meetings? And the second question would be how much do you, or how big is the risk of a recession for the Eurozone? Thank you. Uh, 
as you probably seen, uh, you must have seen from the accounts, there were other members that actually wished a much more extended forward guide. And so this is part of natural discussions we have. And, um, and again, like for the other instruments that we briefly mentioned before, we didn't discuss this. It was not, uh, in a sense, that if I have to characterize this meeting, it was not an operational meeting. It was more, more of a meeting that would characterize the stance of the governing council towards further action. In other words, people are acknowledging, governing council members are acknowledging the weakening of the cycle, the weakening of the economy, the, the fact that this weakening will extend into the rest of the year, the weakening of inflation. In fact, I just said that the, the inflation will probably bottom at, in September. Uh, the, uh, they acknowledge the sliding of inflation expectations. Uh, at the same time, they acknowledge also the underlying strength of the economy, the fact that, uh, that uh, some of these temporary factors are unwinding. And so it was just uh, a, a, it was a meeting where the, um, the, the, main, the main goal of which was to reassert the readiness to act if the contingencies would warrant so. And again, uh, as, as, the, as, we, as we move towards June, where the new projections will be available, we'll be gathering more and more information. Oh, um, the, the estimated probabilities of a recession remain low, remain low. Uh, again, there is a difference with 2016, uh, and um, and so that's that's what we see now. It's uh, it's still a relatively low probability. You you may remember. No, I don't think you would. But uh, just I, in my ECB watcher speech, I gave a number of I think I think there have been 50, 56 soft patches in the last. Uh, 60 years, 50 years of the Eurozone, and only four recessions. So for what it's worth, really, because that's historical evidence looking at the past. But overall, uh, in, uh, probabilities of a recession, also in, implied financial probabilities of a recession remain on the low side, and certainly less than uh, uh, the same probabilities would look like in past recessions. In other words, in the previous episodes of recession, we would have seen much higher probability of an oncoming recession than, than what we see today. But as I said, the governing council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate in that, uh, in that, if that contingency were to materialize. Stefaki? Mr. President, I have two questions. One question is on the mitigation of side effects of negative rates, if any. Are you comfortable with the markets that might read into this, whether there is um, any measure, um, a signal on forward guidance in the sense that if there are less side effects for banks, then uh, in negative interest rates might stay for longer. And so are you comfortable with the market maybe reading into it too much? And on the fact that you are looking at two measures on banks, one on a tiered system for deposits on negative rates and uh, the other on Teltros, uh, does this indicate somehow that um, there is a um, a risk that the excess liquidity is somehow trapped into n the national banking systems and that there is not enough uh, cross-border lending and that uh, because these two measures ha uh, are good for some banks in one case and for some other banks in another case. Thank you. Well, the sec I start with the second question. Um, Clearly, uh, clearly, we would wish to have much more cross-border lending uh, than we have. Uh, but this is also a part of the ongoing discussion on creating, a, on, on finishing with the banking union and creating a capital markets union. It doesn't come out naturally. However, 
What we are observing is that in some countries where credit growth is especially uh, significant, uh, part of this growth can be explained by the participation of, uh, of banks, especially large banks, to syndicated loans that actually get uh, uh, used in other parts other than their countries where these banks are established. So we see some cross-border lending. Uh, and uh, in relation to the Teltro, no, I don't think the liquidity gets necessarily trapped in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the countries. Um, now, the other, the other question was whether one would associate the presence of mitigating measures with, uh, uh, with the lengthening of the period during which interest rates remain negative or not. I don't know. I, I, I have the sense that you are right, that markets perceive this this way. I, have, I don't know what to say, really, because uh, it, as, it's, about, it's a fact that we had negative rates now for many years and there were no mitigating measures. Uh, it, uh, it's also a fact that these, the impact of negative rates, it's very different when they start and then when they've been in place for a long period of time. So we also have to assess that. Um, so and it's not necessarily, well, that's, I, uh, that's what I want to say. It's, um, I don't have other things to add to that. Mr. Fellas? Thank you, Tom Fellas from the Wall Street Journal. I had a follow-up question on what you were just saying. Um, you, you talked about the market reaction function to your, um, your speech at the Watchers Conference. Um, do, I mean, does this mean that a, a, a mitigating negative rates would open the door to a a rate cut, would you, I mean, would you be able to cut rates deeper because if, if so, such a system were in place and by how much do you think? Um, and how, how much would the lower bound fall? And the second question is on what you said about the 2% inflation ceiling, uh, how 2% how isn't a ceiling. Does that mean that you'd be happy to overshoot or aim to overshoot? Thanks. Well, on your second question, I will answer um, saying exactly the same thing. We don't tolerate too low inflation. We remain fully committed to using all necessary instruments to return inflation to 2% without undue delay. Likewise, our inflation aim doesn't imply a ceiling at 2%. Inflation can deviate from our objective in both directions, so long as the path of inflation converges towards our medium-term objective. And I believe I've said, I must have said something close to this or something to this extent a few other times in the past few years. Um, and the other, the, other, the, oh, 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 the other question is this. I mean, many of your questions are, could be captured by the following uh, question. If you are to introduce mitigating measures for banks, uh, for the side effects of low of negative interest rates uh, on banks' profitability, would this imply low rates for longer or lower negative rates? Well, we haven't discussed that. We haven't discussed the introduction of mitigating measures. We have we said that we want to analyze the side effects and possibly the mitigating measures. So we are not even discussing the first stage of this reasoning, not to mention what this would imply. Philippe Lacour. Philippe Lacour, Agence France Presse. Oh, yes. Let me just restate one thing, that uh, the market reaction to the ECB watcher speech, whether it was linked to this part or to another part, showed that markets understand our reaction function. Please. President, so, Agence France Presse, Jean-Philippe Lacour. One question on the Brexit, if I may. Since there are signs in favor of, uh, of longer Brexit today, if uh, so, European Council decide this direction, could you maybe cautiously say something or welcome this possible solution? And I want to remind you, a uh, sub-question to this, what you said here in January is that uh, the Brexit thing 
uh, will not affect the EU uh, economy that much. Would you state the same thing today? That is my question to Brexit. And the second one is more on the European elections coming and, and the end of May. <laughs> uh, with possibility of uh, nationalism or populist parties rising. So is it, it is the capacity or ability of the ECB or the national central banks to intervene somewhat in the debate and promote the, the idea of uh, Europe, which is embodied in your Euro. So in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, answering the second question first. Um, the uh, the um, central banks usually don't intervene in the political debate. Central banks can, on uh, on occasion, um, and especially the ECB, can certainly uh, defend the European framework and point out to the ways to improve <laughs> on it, to complete. Uh, on it to remedy to the weakness that uh, the weaknesses that uh, the recent experience and not so recent uh, have shown, uh, but uh, I don't think central bankers would uh, would be right to intervene in that political debate uh, uh, either in uh, in uh, in the European context or in a national context. Um, I think I gave, uh, I gave uh, two speeches of recent, one in Bologna and the other one in Pisa, uh, both focusing on the, uh, the one in Bologna especially, focusing on the fact that uh, in this globalized world where challenges are global, uh, we got to be together to be truly sovereign, to be truly masters of our own destinies because on our own, uh, we would have no way to cope with these global challenges. And we have, I mean, the evidence is in front of our eyes every day. And, and in Pisa, uh, the speech was more oriented to, uh, to explain why the Euro has been uh, a very positive experience, and at the same time, to identify the weaknesses of the present situation and what we should do to make sure that the benefits of, uh, of the Euro and Europe in general are distributed to everybody. On the Brexit thing, um, I think the, the consequences of a Brexit are different whether it's the, it's, um, um, it's a, a hard, disorderly Brexit, or whether it's a properly, uh, properly managed and uh, with an adequate transition period. So for me, again, two days, whatever, before the vote, they, I mean, they're having vote every day, so, but just, uh, it, it would be, it would be, um, it would not be right to anticipate one thing or another. What it's clear, however, is that um, the whole discussion on Brexit, which has lasted now many years, really, is, is part and parcel of the overall uncertainty that is hanging over uh, our continent, and I think is hanging over the UK as well. It's probably unavoidable of any uh, a very important political discussion, but that's a fact for, for our economies. Also, to be looked with, uh, with, uh, with attention uh, on the real implications of the Brexit on the real economy. As I've said many times, in the aggregate, if you take the aggregate numbers, you don't see. You, you, you wouldn't expect much of, a, of an impact, given the relative size of the two entities. Uh, but there are two important caveats to that. One is that certain countries are especially exposed to the UK economy. And of course, they will have consequences, and the consequences may be, may be serious. And, they, and their serious consequences are bound to reverberate on the rest of the continent. Uh, the second, uh, the second ca uh, caution is that uh, the um, value chains are uh, uh, very extensive 
and um, the ramifications of value chains are also quite broad. Uh, so when, if we are to reach a point where these value chains, which is not at all to be taken for granted, by the way, but if we are to reach a point where these value chains were to be broken, then we can have lots of local and possibly serious effects. But again, I'm still hopeful. Ms. Wackett? Julia Wackett, Börsen Zeitung. I have a question um, regarding your home country, Italy, because yesterday they cut again the growth for our forecasts, and a lot of economists are very worried about Italy that in the next recession, Italy will face serious troubles because they will probably have to save and don't have the fiscal capacity to counteract in a recession. So, how worried are you about Italy? And also, again, about the decision from yesterday to appoint Vice uh, Yves Mersch as uh, for the supervisory mechanism, is there already who will replace Yves Mersch in his position at the ECB? So will Ms. Lautenschläger take over Yves Mersch's role? Or <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on the, I mean, the, the data on the Italian economy didn't come as a surprise. There had been already uh, downgrades in the forecast, in the growth forecast for Italy and for the rest of the Eurozone, as a matter of fact. And um, so, from this viewpoint, uh, it's not a surprise. It's quite clear that the, um, the priority there is to restore growth and employment. And um, uh, Italy knows how to do it. Um, it's a very important that uh, these priorities are being uh, pursued without causing an increase in interest rates because increases in interest rates are contractionary. So I think that's, that's it's, it's in simple words, that should be the aim of economic policy now, there. Uh, on your second point is, um, yes, uh, Mr. Mersch has been appointed by the Governing Council, Vice Chair of the SSM. It's again another great addition to the SSM team, and the Governing Council was, uh, was pleased by that choice. Um, and um, so we have now a, a different, uh, uh, you asked me about uh, who's what? Who's doing? Portfolios. Oh, the portfolios. Uh, Mr. Mersch uh, will remain responsible for legal and the distribution of portfolios will be given, I think immediately after the press conference on our website. But I, I, can, I can anticipate that some of the, uh, the rest of Mr. Mersch's portfolios and some of Mr. Curry's portfolio will go to Ms. Lauterschläger. So it's a different, it's a rearrangement, different combinations. Thank you. Mr. Heitner. Uh, Luke Heitner, Market News. Mr. Draghi, Oli Wren has called for a re-examination of the monetary policy framework, something the Fed is already doing. Would, you, would price level targeting be one possible measure the ECB could adopt? And my second question was, according to the account, rather than the minutes, of last month's monetary policy meeting, Good. it was highlighted that growth might not, meet, might not be mean reverting, um, as typically assumed in projections. Do you think this reinforces the need for such a re-evaluation? Reinforces what? Re reinforces the need for such a re-evaluation, as suggested by Mr. Wren. Uh, you're asking me a very difficult question, which has not been addressed by the by the council, and uh, and we have to see exactly what it means, where it's uh, where it's driving, whether it's justified or not. Uh, so we have to see. It's just one uh, one statement. Uh, it's um, but having said that, I mean the Fed is embarking in a revisitation of the monetary policy framework, uh, and uh, again we have to see what's going to come out of that. Uh, these are not uh, processes that can be uh, discussed uh, in, uh, in one or two meetings. Uh, so it may, they, it may take several months. Mr. Ewing? Uh, Jack Ewing, New York Times. Um, Mr. Draghi, you mentioned a couple of mi minutes ago the benefits of uh, cross-border banking. Uh, as you know, there's uh, a discussion about a big banking consolidation here in Frankfurt. I'm sure you don't want to speak about specific banks, but as a general principle, uh, would it perhaps be more beneficial for banks to be 
uh, looking for mergers across border rather than creating bigger domestic banks. Uh, and a related question, I wonder if you can tell us anything about what role the ECB as banking supervisor uh, might play when there's a, a major uh, banking consolidation uh, in terms of oversight. For example, would you uh, be seeking perhaps uh, require banks to raise more capital or even try to, to block a merger if you thought it was unwise? I wonder if you can tell us generally what the ECB's approach will be. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, the role of a supervisor, second question, the role of a supervisor when witnessing mergers uh, is one where uh, you want to make sure that the transaction is successful. And to be successful means that uh, that not only pleases the shareholders, but actually it creates an entity which is, uh, which is strong and uh, capable of coping with the various challenges. I think that's the, 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 the role of the supervisor is not necessarily one where it wants to, uh, it, it wants to address or um, uh, the, the agents towards a certain direction, but it just uh, unless the direction they've chosen is leading to a, a suboptimal outcome. Uh, the, uh, the first question was about cross-border lending, cross-border mergers. I don't think there is a, a clear uh, preference to, I, I don't think that's my own view, there isn't a clear preference towards having one or the other. What is pretty clear, however, is that the banking system in Europe is overcrowded. The need for consolidation is uh, very, very significant. And um, a part of the structural weakness of the banking system in Europe is caused by this uh, overcapacity in banking, which is not overcapacity in the sense that it's a little production of credit. It's over capacity in terms of number of people, number of branches, uh, costs. Cost. We're talking about countries where there are banks that have a cost income ratio of over 80, 90 percent. And they even, they even quarrel about negative deposit rates as being the, one of the causes of their lack of profitability. I think I'd rather think about this. I'd rather think about low level of digitalization. Uh, and I think there are a series of actions that improve the business model, rationalize the business model, that can be achieved, however, only through consolidation. So there is an issue about, um, there is an issue about, uh, there is a relationship between scale and the capacity to undertake the investments that are needed to improve technology and be competitive especially in certain business models. I wouldn't argue that all business models are like that, but certainly in some of them, this, this is the situation. Mr. Smith? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Jeffrey Smith from investing.com. Um, you talked about um, the, the toolbox that you've got, but you've had 10 years of LTROs, TELTROs, negative rates, quantitative easing. You're still not at 2%. You're still not even really close to it. If anything, your your core inflation rate is, is still trending downwards slightly. What makes you think that the same toolkit will get you to 2% in the future? Aren't you going to need something that you haven't even yet dreamt up? Well, let me just say that it's not 10 years. Uh, first, um, it's several years we've been having this in place, and we've changed the instruments. And frankly, the uh, outcome, the results of our monetary policy action, is being uh, is in front of our eyes. Ten more million jobs. Uh, you may remember how the situation was in 2015, 2014, 2012. So uh, we had to cope with a series of uh, of. Uh, crisis really produced by the great and part of the great financial crisis. The improved conditions all across the board are a testimony that our action has been quite effective. The issue that you are mentioning is that um, we don't see inflation 
going to our objective as fast as we had expected. And there are reasons for that. And we mentioned what the reasons are, and we mentioned that the risks are tilted on the downside. Does it mean that we ought to raise interest rates in the meantime, since uh, our rates so far have not produced any outcome? Of course, the answer is no. Uh, it, uh, our monetary policy has been quite effective. As a matter of fact, it's one of the reasons why we are confident that the inflation rate will converge to our objectives. If we didn't have that monetary policy, we would certainly be less confident. If we are to raise interest rates, we would become less confident of such an outcome. So um, we've done, uh, we've done, the ECB has done a lot to that. The environment proved much more challenging than uh, was expected, say, three years ago. In 2017, growth, world growth was more buoyant, exports, especially the external component is what, what's weighing on growth now. And that is not going to be last. Actually, we see signs of stabilization. So that's the, that's the way I would answer your point. The final question today to Mr. Fiedler from Galileo. Hello, my name is Matthias Fiedler from uh, Pro7 Galileo. How does the ECB's financial policy affect on my life, on the life of our viewers? Well, <laughs> I think what uh, the outcome of our discussions this basically determines uh, determines how cheap is or how expensive is to borrow money. And nowadays, interest rates are very low, which, uh, which means that borrowing is cheap, which means that uh, you can uh, borrow money to buy a house or a car or other consumption goods more easily. Same thing for companies. Companies, they can borrow more easily to buy machines, equipment, this means that they will create jobs. And in due time, this means, and we are seeing it, that wages will go up. And uh, when wage, and wages are actually going up, and uh, going up finally and uh, well-deservedly uh, in all countries, but of course, especially in Germany. And, and this, in due time, will produce also a price increase, and prices will go up. That's what we, that's what we do. That's what we look at. Thank you. Oh, before before we before we uh, we say each other goodbye, I wish to uh, acknowledge the uh, one thing. This was the last monetary policy meeting for Peter Pratt. Uh, Peter uh, usually what happens is that Peter comes in and the day before he presents uh, a vast. Uh, ample and quite detailed explanation of the economic outlook uh, going from the rest of the world and then uh, zeroing on Europe gradually. And then the day after he presents uh, his views on uh, what sort of monetary policy action we should, uh, uh, we should consider, undertake, analyze, or anything like that. Much of what I say in the press conferences and what I read in the introductory statement has been based on his work, on the work that he and his staff and the team and the rest of the ECB does with him. And so I would like to take this opportunity to express my deepest thanks to him. Thank you.